Welcome to this session of the 2021 Agenda Turnace, which is uh, uh, today is about the correlation between the tiny black hole and the big uh, host galaxy. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce the two speakers of today, which are Viola Levato and Antonino Marasco. Viola Levato got his master thesis uh, at the University of Naples and then uh, went for a PhD in the MP in Garting uh, with uh, Gunther Asinger and Alexei Finogenov. Then uh, she has been a postdoc uh, in Helsinki uh, up to 2017. And then uh, she's back in Italy since uh, 2017, uh, first uh, with a Marie Curie Fellowship at Scuola Normale Superiore. And then uh, since April 2021, uh, she's a researcher. Uh, a researcher at the um, Osservatorio Astrofisico di Bologna uh, with, uh, with a grant, the, a pretty enough grant uh, as a special coordinator uh, for, uh, for a research on uh, the link between Arctic galaxies and the large scale, and the large scale structure. Uh, her main research interests are on the interplay between black holes, host galaxies and the large scale structures. This Alviola uh, will be the first to talk. Then we will have Antonino. Antonino Marasco got his uh, PhD in 2013 at the University of Bologna with a thesis, I think, with uh, Fabrizio Fraternali, correct? Uh, Filippo Fraternali, but yes. Philippe, sorry, Filippo Fraternali. <laughs> then he went in, uh, in the Netherlands until 2019 as a postdoc, uh, mainly at the Captain Institute in Reuningen, but also in Astron. And now he's a postdoc in the Arcetri Observatories. His interests are on the study of the cycle of gas around galaxies with a special interest on the stellar feedback and the AGN feedback, uh, the study of scaling relations and uh, the modeling of uh, data, both uh, uh, IFU and interferometric, and then uh, technical of uh, uh, the techniques of uh, analysis of images in general. So uh, I would say this is the presentation. Let's start with our first speaker, uh, Viola. You can start your presentation and share your screen. Yeah. Okay. So can you see my screen? Okay, no. You might just need a couple of minutes. So, so okay. In a minute, just wait a bit. There you go. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you very much, Alessandro, for the introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this tourney. Of course, I'll give you my very personal and very biased view of the topic. So I apologize in advance because I'll not be complete or exhaustive. Uh, so when I've been invited to give, uh, to give this presentation on correlations between the tiny black hole and the big galaxy, this is the first image that came into my mind that I think clearly summarizes the point of the story. So basically we are looking for or studying correlations between a very small object at the center of the galaxy you can consider that like the sphere of influence of the black hole is of the order of parsecs and quantities of the host galaxies, which are measured on scales, which are 100, 1000 times larger than the scale of the black hole. So these correlations are not obvious. Actually, it's very remarkable that we can see these correlations. And that's why we believe that actually there is an intertwined evolution between the black hole and the host galaxy that we usually call black hole and galaxy coevolution. And actually, it took more than 50 years to go from the first observation of the spectrum of a QSO in 1963 by Martin Schmidt by using the Palomar telescope to the first photo of a supermassive black hole and to the uh, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration a few years ago. So of course, we have learned a lot in 50 years. Uh, there are some kind of accepted paradigms, um, like the fact that most of the local galaxies, at least the, the massive local galaxies, host the supermassive black hole at their center. And we believe that the black hole masses correlate with several global properties of those galaxies. 
And we, we all believe that there is a fundamental link between the black hole and the host galaxy. However, the, uh, its interpretation in terms of black hole triggering mechanisms and agent feedback is still under study and under debate. So what do, do, do you, uh, so if you're like a young student and you want to study a bit more the scaling relations, of course you will find a very broad literature. So here you can see an incomplete list of relevant papers. There are also three uh, nice reviews on the topic. And consider that if you con uh, if you um, if you find almost one paper per month this year, so in 2021, on somehow related to scaling relations. So the the question is, what do we know about scaling relations? Of course, uh, I mean I decided in this presentation to focus on a specific relation, which is the black hole stellar mass relation. So we know that there is a tight relation between the black hole mass and the mass of the central bulge. There are also studies suggesting this correlation uh, also with the total mass of the galaxy. And you can see here uh, an incomplete list of paper studies uh, studying this relation. Of course, this picture that I decided to use is very simplistic. So actually uh, the story is more complex. Uh, there are several studies suggesting outliers or departures from this relation, depending on whether or not you consider classical or pseudo bulges, or if you have early type or late type galaxies with or without pirate galaxies, if you include or not, early type galaxies with or without disk. So it's a kind of a jungle. So, but this is not what I want to focus on, on this, uh, in this presentation. What I want to ask to the opponent actually to all of you is whether or not the, the black hole stellar mass relation is a biased relation, okay? So actually uh, the relation that we, we have uh, obtained for the black hole and the galaxy um, usually you, you use a local sample of um, quiescent galaxies with dynamically black hole uh, masses. So more than two, 20 years ago, actually, and this problem has been like uh, reproposed in 2016 by Shankar et al. Uh, what we, we showed is that actually when you have samples of local dynamical black holes, uh, these black holes have um, velocity dispersion and then a black hole mass, which is higher with respect to the full population of galaxies, in this case, uh, uh, the Sloan galaxies. So, and we show it for like four different samples of uh, local dynamical black holes uh, in these four different panels. So actually a similar um, offset uh, has been observed also when you estimate the black hole stellar mass relation by using the AGN. Of course, there is a broad literature. I decided to show you this famous paper by Reins and Volunteri. Uh, that they show like uh, one of the largest collection of local broadline AGNs that you can see as uh, red dots. And they compared this sample with the local sample of early type galaxies. Uh, with dynamically measured black hole masses as presented by Corman and Ho. And in Reins and Volontari, they claimed that you have an offset in the black hole mass uh, at a given stellar mass uh, that can be very large, one of the order of 1.2 dec, and cannot be ascribed to redshift, to error measurements. Um, so, in 2016 and a few years later, in 2019, uh, Shankar et al, we showed that one of the uh, main selection effect that can uh, bias this relation or that can create this offset is the fact that when you have um, samples with dynamically measured black hole masses, you are measuring basically the black holes by using the dynamics of stars and gas around the black hole. So you need to resolve the sphere of influence of the black hole, which is defined by this relation here. So if your sphere of influence is very small, so 
if you have insufficient resolution, this prevent uh, reliable black hole mass estimates, and you are forced to target only the largest, more massive, most massive AG black holes, and this leads to a selection bias. On the contrary, when you have local samples of AGN, you don't have this selection effect because the black hole masses are estimated by using mega measures or reverberation mapping techniques. So actually, we kind of end up with two sets or two families of possible black hole stellar mass relations, as you can see in this plot. So there is a set of relations with the high normalization that uh, you can derive when you use a local dynamical uh, sample of a, a black holes, uh, as the one shown by Savarnian and Graham in 2016, which is this uh, black dashed line, or you can see also the Corman the correlation, which is this uh, cyan dot dashed line. And you also have a set of uh, scaling relations with a lower normalization, possibly also a different uh, slope. Uh, and you obtain these uh, relations with a smaller normalization when you use uh, black, holes, uh, black hole masses estimated for AGN, for example, this green dashed line, which is Reins and Voluntary, or Baron and Menard, which is another uh, work on AGN. And this red continuous line here is the one uh, that we suggest in Shankar et al. 2016 that I will call in this presentation the bias because it's corrected for this bias in not resolving the sphere of influence with the black hole. So basically, what you have is that if you consider, for example, a galaxy of 10 to the 11 solar masses, uh, you will have a black hole, a corresponding black hole with a mass which is one order of magnitude higher if you consider the Savarnian and Gram relation with respect to, for example, Reins and Voluntary. And this discrepancy actually increases when you move to lower stellar masses. And with this star here, um, you can see uh, where the Milky Way locates. Uh, so you can see that uh, the values that we have for the Milky Way are more consistent with scaling relations with the lower normalization. Okay, so why is, do we care so much about like whether or not this black hole stellar mass relation is biased? And why is so important to know what is the normalization and the slope of this relation? So the first um, implication, which is kind of obvious, is that if we uh, if this relation is biased and we don't correct for this bias, uh, looking for outliers uh, of this relation or evolution of this relation with redshift or studying the tightness of this relation is meaningful. But it, this is kind of obvious. On top of that, uh, we know that this, the normalization and the slope of the black hole stellar mass relation may also contain key info on the agent feedback. For example, whether feedback is primarily via energy or momentum transfer. And the normalization of the black hole stellar mass relation is also related to the normalization of the black hole mass function. So if you use um, black hole masses derived uh, for local dynamical black holes, you get a black hole mass function with a higher normalization, which also implies a radiative efficiency of the order of few percent. While if you consider a debiased relation, you get a black hole mass function which is lower in normalization, which implies an, in a radiative efficiency of the order of 50%, which is more consistent with independent studies on the radiative efficiency. And related also to the normalization, on the black hole stellar mass relation, there is also the real factor, FVIR, that we usually use to estimate the black hole masses when we in reverberation mapping techniques. So, for example, in this plot that I showed you before, if you want these uh, red dots, uh, so masses estimated for AGN to match the masses estimated for early type galaxies in Kormi and Ho, you will need a real factor above 15, so which is a very high value compared to values of around three, four, five that 
we get from independent studies. Another obvious implication of, of, the, norm, of the normalization of the black hole stellar mass relation is the fact that at a given stellar mass, if you have lower, smaller black holes, not just possibly in the local universe, but also at high redshift, if we assume that this relation is not evolving with time, then this makes easier the challenge of having massive uh, growing black holes in the early universe. Okay, so and here uh, come, um, comes my first question to the opponent, actually to all of you, and is if the black hole stellar mass relation of local dynamical black holes is biased. So my personal opinion about this is that yes, it is. And actually this bias cannot be neglected. And here comes my third question. Um, if actually we are missing some key ingredient of the story. And my answer is that for sure, we are forgetting the dark matter hello or if you want to better say it with like a cooler image, we need to remember that we believe that galaxies and black holes reside in realized objects that we call dark matter halos. So, and that galaxies and black holes are not randomly distributed in the universe, but they reside in groups and clusters of galaxies and in filaments forming the so-called large scale structure of the universe. So instead of just considering the black hole stellar mass scaling relation, we should study the interplay between the black hole, the host galaxy and the host dark matter halo, and then also consider a black hole halo mass relation. And here in this paper uh, published last year, Nature Astronomy, we showed that actually when you consider the black hole stellar mass relation and you have kind of two families of scaling relations with different normalization, these relations would also produce a black hole halo mass relation with a different normalization. Uh, so, for example, if you consider a black hole with a mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses, uh, this is expected to reside in a halo with a mass which is one order of magnitude smaller, lower, than what you get, for example, when you use a debiased relation, okay? So, basically, if you change your black hole stellar mass relation, you are also changing the black hole halo mass relation. But actually, you are doing even more than this. You are not just changing the mass of the Austin Gallows, you are changing the large scale distribution of your sources. And this is shown here. So maybe uh, you know that when you want to quantify the distribution of your sources in the universe, you use the so, you use the so called projected to point correlation function WP. Uh, which is defined as an excess probability with respect to a random distribution of finding uh, ob object pairs as a function of R. And this is how the WP looks like as a function of RP for a large sample of quasars as shown by Shen et al. 2007. In particular, if you focus only on the large scale, so above RP of one, two megaparsec over H, which is the typical size of a dark matter halo, you are in the so-called linear regime of structure formation. So basically the normalization of your signal is telling you the so-called AGN bias, which is related to the typical mass of the Austin Gallows. So five minutes warming. Five minutes to go. Thank you. So higher is the normalization, larger is the bias, and more massive are the, the, the ELOs. So basically, you can always estimate WP, so the large scale clustering, derive the bias, and derive also the typical mass of the single ELOs. And there have been few studies in the last few years trying to estimate the bias and then the typical mass of the Austin Gallows as a function of the mass. So for the moment, just focus on the data. So we have measured the bias as a function of black hole mass for both X-ray and optically selected AGN, as shown here, a ratio 0.25, 
as derived in Krump et al, and also Reshif 0.1 as derived by Powell et al 2018. So you can see that the bias, then the typical mass of the Austin Gelos is slightly increasing with the black hole mass. And the interesting thing is that uh, the black hole mass does not depend linearly on the halo mass. So less massive velos are less efficient in forming black holes. And now if you focus on the lines, these lines are the prediction, uh, the predictions of the bias as a function of black hole mass when you use different black hole stellar mass scaling relations. So in particular, um, the, um, the, these lines are more in agreement with the data when you use a black hole stellar mass relation as the right, for example, for AGN, which is this green dashed line, or when you use the debiased relation. If instead you use uh, samples with dynamically measured black hole masses, you get a bias as a function of black hole mass, which is too low with respect to data. So, then all these results are basically telling us that the dark matter halo mass might be related to the efficiency in forming the black hole and might regulate the black hole growth. And actually different black hole stellar mass relations uh, determine the large, different large scale clustering and bias and typical mass of the Austin Gelo as a function of the black hole mass. But vice versa, you can use the, these clustering measurements to put constraints on the black hole stellar mass relation. Of course, you can also ask to yourself whether uh, if the black hole, if the bias versus black, uh, black hole mass is only driven by the black hole stellar mass relation as shown in this plot. And we tried to investigate this problem in two recently accepted paper, where basically we show that the bias as a function of black hole mass is independent of the AGN duty cycle. So where the duty cycle is defined as the black probability of a black hole of being active above a given threshold. And in particular, we considered three completely different duty cycles uh, which are constant or decreasing or increasing with the black hole mass. And you can see here that we get the same bias as a function of black hole mass. And you can see in this other panel that actually the bias is only weakly dependent uh, on the stellar mass, halo mass relation. So this is telling you that actually the black hole halo mass relation is primarily driven by the black hole stellar mass scaling relation. And uh, in terms of clustering analysis, uh, additionally interesting results are also obtained if you study the agent bias as a function of redshift. This is what we have done basically in the last 30 years, trying to measure the bias and the large scale clustering of uh, quasars up to ratio of two, three, using different salaries. And what we have found is that the bias, as you can see, increases with redshift, but the typical mass of the Austin Gallows is constant with time. And it's of the order of few times 10 to the 12 solar masses over H, up to a ratio of almost of two or three. This is remarkable because actually hell of 10 to the 12 corresponds to a typical galaxy environment when you are at low redshift. And it corresponds to the larger, largest collapsed systems when you move at high redshift. So it looks like the halo mass itself may regulate the black hole growth. And this is also shown in this very nice review on clustering by Alexander and Nicox, 2012, where you can see the L of mass as a function of redshift. And you can see that actually the range uh, in L of mass uh, 10, between 10 to the 12, 10 to uh, 13, you can find all the quasars and AGN, X-ray selected AGN. So it's like, uh, this is the halo mass range in which the halo um, uh, is basically more efficient in growing massive black holes. Instead, when you move at higher halo masses, so the order 10 to the 14, 
uh, above the maximal quenching, you are reaching the so-called exhausted object. So you are in the hot halo mode regime and you find only radio, mainly radio AGN, which are uh, creating with very low admitter ratio. So this, this is uh, still suggesting that the formation evolution of black holes is controlled by the properties of the dark matter halos in which they reside, in particular, the dark matter halo mass. Of course, these are results by using clustering analysis, but you can study the link between the black hole and the halo mass also by using different techniques. And I think that my opponent will uh, focus on that. So here I conclude and I give you my last questions to question to the opponent, to all of you. So is the connection between the black holes and the dark matter halos of a more fundamental nature than the one between the black hole and the galaxy? Of course, uh, this is more difficult to answer. Uh, I think that for sure is more important than thought. And uh, clustering analysis uh, results suggest that actually the black, the halo mass itself may regulate the black hole growth. And then the black hole mass is indirectly set by the dark matter halo. And I stop here. Thank you, Viola. Yes, Thank you for this very nice presentation. We move on to the second presentation and then we, we have the discussion and we try to answer Viola's questions. So, Antonino. Yes, let me share my screen. Do you see my screen, I guess? And you see my presentation as well? Yes. Okay, do you also see my pointer going around? Yes. Okay, so. So thank you. Okay, so I think I can start. So thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for the kind introduction. And thank you, you know, to the organizer for invite, inviting me to give the contribution, my contribution to this topic, the correlation between the tiny black hole and the big galaxy. And as uh, Viola already anticipated, one should add, oh, I cannot go on. Yeah, I can go on. And the huge dark matter halo, because, the, you know, the true correlation in this, between these three quantities and not between two quantities. But then we start this whole discussion with a little disclaimer first. The disclaimer being is that I cannot really be considered an expert in this particular topic because I've been working on AGN and black hole physics and property only for about a couple of years. So the disclaimer is uh, it's not going to be like this, okay? This journey where you have your experienced astronomer armed with mighty knowledge and capable of facing a very difficult audience or a very difficult opponent, but it's more going to be like this. Now you have your juvenile and a bit naive, perhaps astronomer, who's willing to share his first adventures with, uh, with a possibly benevolent audience. And fortunately, the first adventure have been done in collaboration with other knights more experienced than me. So we can, you know, we, we go through this adventure together. So let me describe the adventure, right? So I am a naive astronomer, uh, as I just said. So let's start with a very naive and simplified galaxy evolution framework where everything is regulated by three quantities, okay? So I, you will see now a series of sketches that I draw myself, sorry for that. Uh, you have a stellar disk with mass M star embedded in a dark matter halo with mass M halo. And at the center of the system lies a supermassive black hole with mass M black holes. These are the three fundamental quantities that we are interested in here. Then, of course, the halo is not empty. It's filled with the halo gas reservoir. You can think of it, uh, the collection of the missing variants. The halo gas reservoir cools with time and feeds uh, the interstellar medium of your galactic disk, within which there are the processes of star formation and black hole feeding. So the mass of the stellar disk and the supermassive black hole grows with time. Now let's complicate a little bit this scenario by remembering that the system is not isolated. So you have extragalactic dark matter acc accretion and gas accretion from the outside, from the cosmic web. And let us remind us that there are uh, internal feedback mechanisms. You have stellar feedback. You can think of it in a simple form of objective kind of feedback. You know, star formation drives outflow. So part of the ISM goes back to the reservoir. And a perhaps more complex uh, AGN feedback that can be both uh, ejective as the stellar one and also preventative. 
meaning that it can slow down or even quench the cooling of the gas reservoir. Now, this complication that I put in these slides, if you think about it, they are not so complex because after all, they are related to the growth of, of mass of the three fundamental quantities that, that I showed before. Now, stellar feedback depends on star formation rate, Agent feedback depends on the uh, accretion of the mass of the black hole, the growth of the mass of the black hole, and by definition, this is uh, dark matter accretion from the cosmic web. Therefore, if in the simple framework, galaxy evolution is regulated by the growth of black hole stars and dark matter halo, and the growth are intertwined, you may well expect that at all redshift, there is a relation between black hole mass, halo mass, and the stellar mass. Okay, so this already contains a hint to the, to the question that Viola posed me. But let's see, let, let's see this better. So we can test this scenario that I sketched here in the nearby universe where we have, uh, where the data are mostly available. Okay, so now it comes a kind of observational part of our study, although we didn't do any real observation. So, but we built a sample, a sample of galaxies with very robust measurement for black hole mass, stellar mass, and halo masses. Okay, uh, so we built a sample of 55 galaxies. These are galaxies with different morphological types. So we have uh, like almost bulgeless spiral up to early type galaxy completely dominated by the bulge. Okay, the black hole mass is based on uh, a variety of techniques, stellar gas or maser dynamics. And I have to say, I never asked myself whether or not these measurements are biased because we cannot resolve the spheroid influence. It's a very interesting question. And I don't think that I have a reply to that right at the moment. Okay, so this is taken for granted from the literature from a collection of uh, well-studied catalogs of black hole masses. Stellar masses comes from uh, late type galaxy from KS band luminosity, and for uh, early type galaxies from dynamical modeling, I will tell you what this means, but let's go to the M-halo estimates, which are all dynamical, okay? And these are all dynamical, meaning that for early type galaxies, we measure it, or, or better, we took it from the work of Posty and Fall, and it's based on the dynamics of globular cluster, okay? So you model the distribution of globular cluster in the phase space with a model using an NFW halo profile and the CERCIC profile for the star. So you can have an estimate on both the halo masses and stellar mass. And then for later galaxies, you cannot play this game any longer because the globular cluster are not so abundant, but fortunately you have rotation curves. Okay, so we uh, digged into the literature to find the rotation curve for many of these objects, and we found it in many cases, mostly from H1. This is the best cold tracer that you have. It's extended and it's cold. In some cases, we had to rely on uh, H alpha and CO, but in most cases we have, we have H1. We went for the measurement of D flat, which is the flat part of the rotation curve. And then we applied a V flat to M halo calibration to infer the halo masses. Okay, this calibration is based on uh, a more uh, you know, complex and refined dynamical modeling of, uh, of uh, uh, rotation curve of nearby galaxies with better data. Is the, actually is the sparks and the spark sample. Now, interestingly enough, for a single galaxy, we could use both methods because this is a large early type galaxy with plenty of globular cluster, but we had, it has the lack of hosting a disk, an H1 disk, so we could use both techniques. We end up with the same halo mass, and so we are quite happy with it. Right, so now let me now jump to the result. Let me show you how these 55 galaxies, uh, which are, in my view, the best possible sample that you can build in the local universe where you have the measurement of all the quantities that you need. Where do they lie in the three-dimensional space made by black hole mass, halo mass, and I you would like to say stellar mass, but I like to talk about another quantity, which is this F star. F star is simply the ratio between stellar mass and halo mass normalized by the baryonic fraction. I like this quantity very much, although it's a derivative quantity. This quantity can be thought as a star formation efficiency because it tells you what is the fraction of the baryons of the theoretically available baryons that your system has been able to convert into star. But if you insist and want to see the relation with M star, I, I have those two. But for now, let's focus on this. So this is how the system 
are located in this three-dimensional space. Okay, you have F star in the vertical axis and M, -O -M, -M black hole and M halo on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the plane, on the, on the base axis. Okay, so all galaxies appear to align along a somewhat well-defined sequence, okay, which is represented by the line. The line that you see, the colored curve line that you see is not actually some analytical function that I fit to the data, but it comes from an evolutionary model that I'll discuss later on. For now, let's focus on the, I mean, the different points. Uh, I, did, I use different symbols. The circles are, uh, are uh, early type system, the squares are late type galaxies hosting a classical bulge of different sizes, and the stars are a late type system hosting pseudo bulges. Okay, so this is only a fancy three dimensional view, but okay, yeah, here I wanted to put a, a tourney related image, but I couldn't find anything better. So let's put something that rotates, that rotate quite now. But so let's study the correlation between pairs of quantities. Here I'm showing all the possible pairs. This is M black hole versus M halo. This is F star versus M halo. And this is F star versus M black hole. And you can see that all the quantities are tightly correlated. Surprisingly enough, there is a very, very tight correlation, even perhaps better than the others, between the black hole mass and the halo mass. It was already mentioned, introduced, and been discussed by, by Viola. Another interesting thing is that different morphological types somewhat seems to obey the same to the same global trend because it is certainly well true that uh, early type system so the circles in this plot live preferentially at the high uh, m halo range while uh, uh, late type galaxies are at uh, lower masses but overall when you put everything together you can see a kind of unique of unique path in this three dimensional space Okay, and another important and interesting feature that I would like to address is that something is happening in this scaling relation at black hole masses between, let's say, 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8. Here you can see that either the scatter is increasing or there is uh, a bend in the relation. No? You can imagine a trajectory that goes like this and then it goes down like this. And even here you can imagine somewhat a bend in the scaling relation. So something is happening at that particular black hole masses. There is a feature by eye. Very quickly, uh, the data, you can dig into the data better and you discover that there are correlation even in the residual. In particular, if you fix the black hole mass, there are correlation between F star and anti-correlation actually between F star and M halo, meaning that uh, at fixed black hole masses, galaxies that live in lighter halo, they are also more efficient in terms of global star formation efficiency, okay? And vice versa on the other side. Well, there is nothing at fixed, at fixed halo mass. This is interesting, but uh, I'm going to go quick on this, on this point. Okay, now let's, let's move to a slightly more theoretical part. If I have to understand, I mean, I couldn't really understand what all these relations mean without using a galaxy evolution framework. And I could use something that uh, has been dealt, uh, has built up already by other people, or, but I prefer to use something that I could build up myself, uh, so a simple framework, which is sketched here. So this is basically only a mathematical version or the, of the very naive evolutionary framework that I mentioned at the beginning. And basically in this framework, we follow the evolution with redshift of uh, seeds, black hole masses, uh, halo masses, and M star in Lambda CDM framework. So you start uh, with, with your galaxy model, you, uh, you go on with time. So there is cosmological accretion of dark matter and gas. Okay, this is uh, somewhat uh, set by the cosmological model. You cannot play very much with it. And by assuming that the entire gas reservoir is at virial temperature, you, some, you can somewhat infer uh, a gas cooling rate. So you have, for instance, a shell or a fraction of this gas that is cold. And uh, in a proper theoretical framework, this cold gas, this cooling gas should feed your, your ISM and you should be able to follow the ISM processes. But uh, to simplify as much as possible the treatment, we assume that this cold gas is immediately usable by the black hole or by, for, or by the stars. And actually the primary target is the black hole. The black hole attempts to accrete this gas at the bondy rate because it lives at the center, everything is symmetrical, every, everything is, uh, 
yes, symmetrical with respect to the center, the black hole wants to accrete it first, and it accretes at the Bondi rate, and there is some uh, output energy, no? the black hole output uh, into, the, into the gas phase, a fraction of this accreted mass-stress uh, energy. Uh, and the fundamental, uh, the fundamental key ingredient of this model is that uh, the energy emitted by the black hole, which is accumulated over time, cannot exceed the gravitational binding energy of the cooling material, okay? So this is, this is the key ingredient. If this condition is satisfied, so a black hole is inferior than the, than the a cooling, uh, so the black hole accretes at the Bondi rate, and if there is some leftover gas that has not been accreted by the black hole, it goes into star and wins uh, uh, emitted by stellar feedback. Okay? Stellar feedback is modeled in simple ways, ejective and mass dependent. When this condition is not satisfied, though, the black hole accretion is reduced so that the energy balance is maintained, and there is no, and there is no material going back from a star, so your galaxy is actually quenched. So this is the case. Lots of word, so it's easier to, if I just show you what are basically the evolutionary path of a model like this one, okay? So these are the, the growth with ratio of the three quantities, M black hole, M star, uh, sorry, sorry, this is the M halo, this is M star, and this is the mass of the black hole as a function of the redshift uh, for one typical halo, okay? And uh, uh, you can see different phases. If you focus on the, on the black hole mass versus redshift, there is first a slow growth, which is caused by the fact that for the way we have implemented stellar feedback, uh, the, the, the feedback basically diminish the density of the gas at the center of the system, so the, the, the black hole cannot be fed. But then this, this feedback mechanism is not effective any longer, and you face a very rapid growth at the Bondi rate. But at some point, there is the energy condition that is met. So there is a complete change in the slope of the mass accretion of the black hole, which is basically this part of the line over here, which happens in this case at redshift two, and this corresponds also to the quenching. As I said, at some point, the black hole basically starts to self-regulate itself and is stealing all the material uh, to the galaxy. So the, the, the system is actually quenched, star formation is set to zero. Okay, you can repeat the study for different uh, uh, halo masses and you discover, for instance, that uh, according to the downsizing scenario, the system with the highest stellar mass has been those that have been quenched first in this simple model. So this is a feature of the very simple model, but let's see, does it work? Let's go back to the data. Same data that I showed you before. I only enlarged a bit here the the, the, uh, the, the F star M halo plane in order to accommodate for other system. These are spark galaxies, so low mass galaxies that uh, um, basically help me to populate the low mass part of this diagram. And on top of it, I, I put the stellar to halo mass relation by Moster at all 2013. Now this is a well-known scaling relation. I mean, this plot is supposed to go this way. Antonino, five minutes. Yes, okay, five minutes. This is how um, our model goes on top of the data. Once you adjust a little bit, we have five, like five free parameters. Once you adjust them a little bit, but like by eye, no, no fancy thing, uh, you can really reproduce the entire, the, the entire three-dimensional space. This is actually the line that I show you in the three-dimensional rotating plot at the beginning, okay? So you can see that indeed, when you reach a black hole mass of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7, there is a break, okay? it's about 10 to the 7 in this particular model. There is a break, and this caused by the change in the black hole accretion mode. On this part of the diagram lie all the galaxies where the black hole is self-regulating, self its accretion is self-regulating because it's continuously limited by the, by the cool. There is the energy balance going on, okay? Well, here the black hole accretes very efficiently, okay? And this produces a break that is visible pretty much everywhere in this panel. Also, another important feature of the model is that the slope of this, of this line is set univocally by the energy balance. So I cannot do anything in my model to change the slope of this relation as long as I assume the energy balance going on. I can change the normalization, but not the slope. You can see there is a red part and the blue part, and uh, the red part, of course, are all the systems that are 
quenched by my agent feedback in my model. In the blue part, uh, instead, the system still start forming. It's a very simple division with no scatter. So it's a simplification, but it actually uh, it seems to obey when, uh, when, when I put my galaxy in the star formation rate stellar mass plane, it works very well. Now it reproduces the data that we see in the nearby universe. So this is the sequence of star forming that I obtain. And this is the sequence of quenched galaxy. So it works, right? I don't go into details, but if you include some scattering in the, in the model parameters, you can even reproduce the correlation in, in the residual, okay? The anti-correlation between F star and M halo at fixed black hole masses. And it turns out that this is driven by the scatter in the, in the black hole, uh, uh, in the black hole uh, feedback, okay? In the, in the efficiency of the feedback. Okay, but let's now, um, since I have really little meat note, let me say a few words and let's dive into the world of hydrodynamical simulation because I presented a very, very naive model. But what happens if I go to a more complicated model like in Illustris TNG 50? Well, it seems that something is happening at these magical black hole masses of, in the case of Illustris TNG, 10 to the 8. Because this is the threshold between system whose feedback is completely dominated by the so-called thermal mode is this quasar mode uh, where the energy is injected thermally in illustrious TNG and the kinetic mode of feedback or uh, the radio mode, if you, if you want to call it this way, okay? Systems that have uh, black hole masses above 10 to the eight, uh, feedback, the kinetic mode become very, very important. And this has two consequences in illustrious TNG model. First of all, uh, most of the gas within the galaxy uh, sees a jump, a huge increase uh, in, the, in the entropy. So this is the entropy. Uh, so this is a plot showing the galactic gas as a function of the black hole mass of the system and the entropy. So increasing the entropy means that this, this gas is not usable any longer for star formation because he desires to leave the system, okay? So this is some form of objective feedback, but the feedback is also preventative because uh, the kinetic mode increases the cooling time of the gas. And this is a collection of snapshots uh, ordered by increasing black hole mass. And the colors are the ratio between the cooling time and the free fall time. So when you increase enough your halo mass and you start to be in, in uh, sorry, black hole mass, like in this case over here, uh, your entire galactic ecosystem has very, very large cooling time compared to the free fall time. So it's basically, you cannot cool any longer from the circumgalactic medium, okay? This circle is, is the virial radius. So we are talking about very extensive, very, a very radially extended field. So the feedback is both effective and preventative, uh, like, uh, like in our case. And so everything, I see lots of connection with, uh, with my simple model, except that then when you look at the, illustrious TNG catalog, nothing works, or at least the scaling relation are not properly reproduced. When you go to Eagle, the situation is slightly better. And Eagle is only one mode of feedback, the thermal mode, uh, AGN feedback. So more work needs to be done to understand better the physics, what's going on uh, at the center of the galaxy, the AGN feedback. So these are my conclusion for, the, for this, uh, my talk for this, uh, this um, this journey, okay? Nearby galaxies align along a very well-defined sequence in this three-dimensional space. There is no very clear independence on the structural properties of galaxies. And there is a break in the scaling law that appears at the magical black hole masses between 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight, okay? And these trends all seem to be compatible with a simple evolutionary model in Lambda CDM framework where the, the key ingredient is the energy balance between the energy emitted by the black hole, the output emitted by black hole, and the cooling of the, and the uh, gravitational binding energy, okay? So the AGM feedback is responsible for quenching the galaxies and regulating the own growth of the black hole per se. And finally, uh, I still believe that uh, the details, the, uh, the feedback of the AGM physics still needs to be understood. Okay, to better understand what's going on. So in other words, this, uh, this energy balance is something that I put my hand in the model, but understanding what it means physically, how it works is the challenge here. Okay, so, I, so I'm done. I realized that I didn't really reply to, to uh, 
many of the questions that, uh, that Fiola made, but now I can reply to the very last one. And it means that uh, in a scenario where uh, the feeding of the galaxy, so the growth of the star and the growth of the black hole are both regulated by your dark matter halo, which is basically attracting gas from the outside, it is very natural to think that there is a connection between all these three different scales. And perhaps it's not so incredibly surprising that is the halo mass that regulates all the scaling relation rather than uh, looking separately at the black hole and at the stars. And I think that I'm done. Sorry for being a bit late. Thank you, Antonino, for the very nice talk, too. We had two very nice talks. Now it is time for the discussion. I would say that uh, uh, those who want to ask questions, uh, you have to just raise your hand with Zoom and the reactions, there is a raise hand. And then I will, we will go in order. If you want to write your question in the chat, I will, uh, I will ask the question for you. So the first one is Fabio Lafranca. Ciao, Fabio. Ciao a tutti, everybody. I have two questions, one for Viola, another one for Antonino, very short ones. Uh, Viola, in the last, one of the last pictures, we have seen that the bias is increasing of re with redshift for the RGNs. Are those samples of RGNs uh, sharing the same luminosity threshold? Because otherwise, if, if we have a more luminous object at large redshift, this can, be, can cause some uh, trends that uh, are not correct. And the second yeah. question for Antonino, very short one, uh, how were the black hole masses computed in the, your, your, your analysis? Okay, so I think I can first reply to Fabio's question. So yeah, Fabio, you are right. Uh, that's why I decided to show only the bias evolution as a function of redshift only for quasars without mixing X-ray selected or infrared selected because I mean, um, you can be quite sure that for those uh, samples of the quasars, they are selected in different, in different surveys, I agree. But at, at, at the end, you have for all of them uh, a similar mean luminosity. So they are all uh, objects with a bolometric luminosity of the order of 10 to 46 per second. Okay, so... Uh, of, I mean, for sure, there, there can be different cuts in luminosities, but that's why I focused only on quasars. This is true when you mix maybe more like X-ray, optically selected AGN and so on. So I'm quite confident that there is a bias evolution with redshift with the constant halo mass, at least for quasars. And we have like so many uh, data that I mean, I'm quite confident about it. Okay, thank you, Viola. Uh, Fabio, yeah. are you satisfied with Viola's answer? Then we can move to the question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Then Antonino. Yes, yeah, I'm not going Fabio. to be yeah, so exhaustive. So basically, I have not been so conservative in choosing my, my, my sample, meaning that you can only deal with a few galaxies where everything can, can be computed. So I picked pretty much everything that I could. So it's a, it's a mixed sample where the black hole mass has been estimated through all dynamical measurements, okay? So there is not, uh, say, it's a, it's a, the, these are direct dynamical measurements, but with a variety of traces, so gas, stars, and mazes, preferentially gas and stars, okay? Uh, but it's mixed, it's true. So if there are heavy bias, I would say it's maybe unlikely to get, that everything comes up into a coherent picture. No, it's, so this, this is my point. So uh, those are not uh, AGNs, are, uh, they, they are not based on single epoch measurements, are based, based on stellar dispersions and something like that. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. Or no, you know, broadline re width of the broadline regions uh, for, for the gas trace, uh, this kind of thing. So yes. Thank you. Okay, other questions? I have, I have a question. See, we are, while we are waiting for the audience to, to ask other questions, I have a question for Viola. Uh, you didn't say anything about the redshift evolution of the black hole galaxy relations. How 
to your bias measurements, the variation of the bias with the redshift, that, does it has any relation? Can, can we get any relation from that and the, the possible evolution of the M black hole galaxy relations? Okay, so good question. So for the moment, uh, I mean, all the models that I use to get the expected evolution of the bias when changing the input black hole stellar mass relation are assuming that the black hole stellar mass relation is not evolving with time. And actually there are few works suggesting it, like for example, a few years ago, there was this paper with the, um, Sue et al, 2019, if I remember correctly, where we showed that there is no evolution. Then when we will, I mean, I, my, my hope is that soon, possibly also with like Euclid and Hiroshita, we will also study the typical mass or the bias large scale clustering as a function of the black hole mass at higher redshift, okay? And then we can also include one additional three parameters in the model at play also with whether or not this relation is evolving and possibly get constraints on the evolution from the clustering. But we need uh, estimates at larger redshift. So for the moment, all these studies are possible at low redshift where we have black hole masses, we have large samples of AGN. But in the future, I think we, we will be able to put constraints on it from the clustering. Okay, thanks. But personally, I think that there must be an evolution with redshift, for instance, because otherwise, if you consider the quasars 10 to the 9 solar masses at uh, a redshift above 6, then you cannot certainly expect to have uh, a 10 to the 12 uh, solar mass galaxy yeah. with the stars mm -hmm. already formed. So maybe it's not, I mean, the, the ratio between the mass of the stars and the mass of the black hole must evolve, should evolve with redshift. Yeah. Maybe that's not true for other quantities like the relation with the halo mass or... Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about just, in, just redshift evolutions, uh, evolution up to redshift of two, three. Okay, this, in the, I in mean, the, low, the in maximum the that I can imagine for like clustering analysis of uh, AG and okay, okay. Well, sure, of course. It's a different story. So we, I, I think in my opinion is, and these are like the results from different studies, that the evolution is weak up to ratio from like two or three. Then it's a different story. I might agree with you. Okay, do we have... Uh... Other questions, or do you want, uh, let's say, uh, there were these questions by uh, Viola whether the M black hole M star relation was biased. Uh, I must uh, say that uh, I must agree with Viola because that was one of the quarters of the first paper. So <laughs> I agree with Viola. And uh, does any of the people in the audience have something to say about this, about the bias of the M black hole uh, galaxy relations? Uh, Gianni? Yes. Uh, Viola, with respect to this, uh, I would like to better understand the following about the bias. Suppose we start from a mass selected sample of galaxies. And then we try to measure black hole masses. In some cases, we will succeed. In some cases, we don't. And in those cases, uh, we will use upper limits. Why should this pro produce a bias estimate? OK, so I'm, what I'm saying, maybe I wasn't like 100% clear. What I'm saying is that if you um, derive the black hole stellar mass relation by just using a local sample of early type galaxies with dynamically measured black hole masses, um, your black hole stellar mass relation will be biased because you are, um, your sample of early type galaxies is not like representative of the overall population. So the point is that if you want to derive black hole masses by using a proxy as proxy, the stellar mass, you cannot use, for example, the famous Corman de Ho relation because this relation is not representative of the full population of the black holes. This is what I'm saying. 
So if you measure uh, black hole masses with, um, you get dynamically measured black hole masses, they are not like wrong. I'm just saying that if you build, you, you build your black hole stellar mass relation on these estimates, your relation is not representative of the full population is biased because you are targeting only the most massive black holes. Okay, this is what I'm saying. And this um, problem is more evident when you have low mass black holes, of course, and low mass galaxies. Okay, because then at uh, high end, uh, mass and uh, then you converge. Okay, so you are basically getting all the possible black holes that you have. Is it like uh, more clear now, Gianni? Uh, well, I see also an answer from Fabio in the chat. He says, because upper limits are not taken into account. Uh, uh, yeah. But I don't know if this is the case. In many uh, samples, there are few cases of failure of, in the measurement of black hole, and in some cases, upper limits are, are taken into account. So, uh, my Gianni, question, but um, yes. most of the measurements we are done just to to find and to measure the black hole mass. It's, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a study in which you select a sample of galaxies and you try to measure that the black hole mass in that large sample of galaxies. It's just a, a shot at the most, at the object which are most likely to provide you a black hole mass. Mm -hmm. And we are biased probably by this measurement which were done at the beginning. Now we are in a better condition that we were 20 or more years ago in measuring black hole masses because of AO systems and uh, whatever, but at the beginning, most of the data from the early times, early years, were just uh, uh, observation of objects which were likely to provide you with a black hole mass, mm -hmm. which were measurable. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is the bias uh, that uh, Viola was referring to, basically. Yes, yes. And, and I think that Viola, maybe I don't remember if you said that, but the clearest way to show that this sample is biased is just to if you look at the uh, luminosity velocity dispersion relation for the <coughs> galaxies uh, which with the black hole masses, those are just the luminosity of the galaxy of the spheroid and velocity dispersion of the spheroids. And you compare that with the luminosity velocity the dispersion <coughs> of, I don't remember the name of this relation, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I was showing a similar relation. It was the sigma M star relation. Exactly. So, yeah. So the black hole mass wasn't like involved in this. Yeah, exactly. You see that there is the yeah. bias. The sample is biased. Yeah. If you just consider the host galaxies, so you you are able to measure the black hole masses at the end only for the most massive galaxies, which are not representative of the full population of the galaxy. So actually, I have a question for Antonino, if I can. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so because you are too um, friendly to I each don't know other. If... Yeah, we are. You are too friendly so... to each other. We want to see the blood. <laughs> so actually, uh, if I remember correctly, a few years ago, there was this paper by Cormandy, and I don't remember the second author, saying that actually the relation between the black hole mass and the yellow mass is some kind of like conspiracy. Like it's just due to the fact that you, it's valid only for elliptical galaxies, but this is not what you find, right? Uh, no, in fact, in okay. fact. So it's, it's, I mean, it's true that if I select, <clears throat> for instance, let, let's assume that I only show the plots for galaxy hosting pseudobulges they lie in a portion, in a region, a segregated region of the M black hole and halo plane. Then I do again the relation for uh, late type system with pseudobulges. They are uh, somewhere there, but a bit shifted. If I put everything together, all aligns, okay, forming a given relation. So there in that plane, that's very interesting because in that plane, I don't see a clean effect of the morphology, not at all. When I go to another plane, M star, M black hole there, and you show that too, 
the effect of the morphology arises a bit better. It's not incredibly huge effect, but it's definitely in there, okay? Yeah. So yes, I, I think that, yes, I mean, I am a bit against the, the, the view of Corman. The, uh, I know, I, I agree that there is an effect of the morphology, but I don't see it uh, in that space. When I look at stellar mass, stellar component, it's in there. But let me also add that uh, people also find the effect on morphology on uh, way, what, what are believed to be way more fundamental scaling relation. No? And black hole sigma, there are those who find a very, very clean effect on morphology, on ball fraction, on Celsius index. So the picture is not clear at all. When, as, the moment you put stars into the mix, the picture becomes fuzzy. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And actually, it was nice to see that also by using different methodologies, like in the one that you showed, that the hello is like relevant. Because usually, when I talk about like clustering or large scale structure of the universe, no, I mean, nobody cares too much. I mean, they, they don't think that like the hello mass is like fundamental actually uh -huh, uh -huh. in setting the black hole grow. While actually, I think that now it's evident, not just from clustering analysis, but also from like different studies. And so we should consider it. Yeah, yeah. I believe it was shocking uh, in, at the beginning when Ferrarese showed the first results because one could interpret the, this saying, uh, well, the black hole physics is set by the dark matter physics, the baryons play no role, which is, uh, I understand, a bit shocking. But mm -hmm. no, that's not perhaps the case, really. Um, uh, it's just that the black hole and the stars are son of what happens to the gas embedded in the dark matter halo. So see, Alessandro, we, we agree too, too much with each other to shed blood, <laughs> so I believe. And, so, and sorry. I might add to this, to, co to finish to the questions by Viola, that uh, Cormendi maybe wanted to show that Laura Ferrarese was wrong. So maybe yeah. there was a bias in that. So it was not very open to the to that yeah. possibility. I mean, actually there were, there have been like also a few papers from Carmendy trying to show that the bias that we show in our paper is wrong. So it's- Yeah, uh, but uh, whatever they don't do is wrong by default. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way it is for them, so. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions from the, from the audience? No questions, one hour, which is supposed to be the one hour and 10 minutes, more or less, which is supposed to be the duration of this meeting, uh, correct, uh, uh, Beta, you? Yeah. Okay, so we can, uh, unless there are any last minute question, we there can- There is one question, I can see one raise hand, is that correct? I don't see, a... ah, okay, raise hand, let me see. No, there is a-, oh. a not raise hand anymore. And applause. <laughs> oh, it's an applause. Oh, thank you. I was clapping. So, I it's would like funny. to thank. <laughs> I would like to thank Antonino and Viola for these very nice talks and uh, discussion. Thanks again, and I leave you the words, uh, the the scene to Beta to for the concluding remarks. So I have uh, just a uh, few, um, just one announcement. Um, well, let me first thank the two nights for all of today. And uh, tomorrow we will have uh, two sessions. Just save mm -hmm. this in your calendar. One is the morning session at 11 a.m. and an afternoon session at 3 p.m. like today. Um, an email will be sent in due time tomorrow morning. So um, just take this uh, in, uh, in your agenda. And uh, on behalf of the SOC and the LUC, I just want to thank you all of you for attending. I guess that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Beth, Alessandro, Viola and the others organizers. Yeah, thank you, everybody. <laughs>